I shall not be sharing a sermon with you. I want us to go interactive. I want us to talk. Amen? And the theme, the theme I want us to discuss is this. Nigeria and Christianity. Okay? We have at least, at least 40 million Nigerians that call themselves Christians. Could be 50, could be 60, could be more. And if we have so many Christians in Nigeria, why is our nation like this? Why do we have phenomenal levels of corruption? Why, with all the resources we have been blessed with, is development so hard for us? And I want us, and I want you, and I'm stationing a few people with microphones. I want us not only to answer why, and please, you have parliamentary privilege this morning. Please speak your heart. Let's find out what the problem is. Is it a problem with the church? Is it our brand of Christianity? And then let us not go away just identifying the problem. Let us identify solutions, individual solutions, what we as individuals can do and what we can do corporately. Is this okay? Will you talk? Let's kick the ball rolling. Who's going to? Thank you. Nigeria's problem is really the elite. The elite, the disdain for law and order. Okay. So the elite have no re respect for law and order. Okay. And it is obvious that when the elite have no respect for law and order, it's like the Aaron's, the, the oil that flowed from Aaron's head, it will affect everybody else, okay? Has anybody else got something to say right there? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Um, I think the issue of corruption in Nigeria is endemic. Um, like, I'm a lawyer by profession. When you do businesses like land matters, you find yourself having to charge your clients for PR, but that PR is actually a bribe, and they're not gonna do anything except, you know, you give something. And it bothers me that, oh, we are helping the system to be more corrupt. So I think there should be a situation whereby um, we, I don't know. I mean, but because every time I do all these matters, I keep going home and say, Lord, I'm sorry. This is not supposed to be. But you see, you find yourself again telling your client PR. Because without that, they're not going to... Though there's a new system now. The government itself is trying to improve land matters. They don't want, you know, a situation whereby you can just access them anyhow. What I think is endemic, not only the elite, even the lower ones, from the messenger up to the MD, Everybody in one way or the other, we all compromise. That's the problem. So we need to take our stand as Christians. Thank you. Okay. Is there something faulty with our Christianity? Is there something faulty? Okay, I'm still on that side, but there. I think, um, like you said, we have 40 million Christians, estimated at least. At least. But I think it's 40 million 40 million Christians on Sundays, 40 million Christians, midweek service, a bit less, and night vigil. So what you're saying is that Christianity is very shallow, okay? The gentleman behind the man with the blue shirt, you had something to say. 
is it's Christianity has become very rigid. People have forgotten the simple gospel that Jesus brought, that you should imbibe the, 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 the fruit of the Spirit and spread the gospel. It's gone into a whole bunch of people trying to show that they're, it's become about showmanship, which isn't what Christianity is about, but ultimately you exhibit those characteristics that Jesus imbibed each day and by grace, and you become more like him. The next person is supposed to mirror that and see it in you and know that you're a Christian. Okay. Okay. Let me try and move the conversation along. Let me take you quickly. I think Nigeria is not alone. It's Africa in general. Christianity has moved from the heart of God. We are focusing on the hand of God. Sin is no longer discussed in church. Thank you very much. Okay, my brother up there. The problem with Nigeria is that, of, is that one of idolatry. I think we're essentially idol worshippers. And the biggest idol in the country now is money, mammon. So if we identify that as a spiritual problem, then it means that the solution would ordinarily come from the church. Because we are light, we are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Unfortunately, the church is also into idolatry and is worshipping money. I like what you said. We seek the hand of God rather than his face. Let me just move the conversation on a little. When you first came to the Lord, what were you promised? What was it God was going to do for you? Because it seems to me that so many people are promised blessings. You, God will take care of every problem you have. You won't have problems anymore. You will have a job. You will have money and all the material things. So it seems to me that what is happening in the church, and I accept that it is not only in Nigeria, but Nigeria tends to lead. And what happens in Nigeria will tend to flow to the rest of Africa. That we, we've entered a, we, we, we practice a gospel which puts me or self at the center of our Christianity. Okay. Somebody was, yeah, 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 lady over there. In a Christian family, but um, as I grew older, I began to have a definition of Christianity for myself. And the first thing I understood about Christianity, pretty much what I was promised as a Christian was that I was going to have an easy life, things were going to be okay, um, pretty much that. But eventually, I discovered that that's all a lie. Because even the apostles in the Bible had trials and tribulations. Paul especially did not have an easy life. So I got to discover in one single word that God is sovereign and he controls everything and he never sleeps. So even when bad things happen to me, I know that God knows of it and he allowed it to happen. So I have come to the settlement and realization that good things happen and bad things happen to good people also. So it's not always all good. And when they happen, it's your faith that gets you through that um, bad stuff. Thank you. Somebody else over there had their hand up. That will kind of take us back to Christianity being shallow. And I think it picks up on that. Um, what Pastor said about um, we are looking to God more about us. Not to criticize, I love the concept of the Hallelujah Challenge, but I wish more people had focused on it, looking to hear from God about what God wants to do with regards to his church, with regards to moving things forward, with regards to looking for things for the nation as opposed to things that are personal to them. And I think we also can't entirely blame the congregation. We have to also look at the role of the church. When we look at what Jesus did and when we look at what the apostles did in Acts, they showed how to live. A lot of what we learn from Jesus are not just about the messages he gave us. If you just preached and we learned just from his sermons, 
then we could live the same way. But we learned from his acts. And the church is not taking that role. The church in Nigeria must spend a minimum of 3 billion naira a year on programs. If we took half of that and set up halfway homes for people to live, industries for people to work, things that could, we could actually build cities that would run the way cities should run. And then the nation can look to us and learn that the world should look to, then they can look to us for solutions. But we ourselves aren't doing those things and that is why we are the way we are. I, I'm having a problem. Where exactly are you? I, saw, I heard you speak. Yeah. Please can you give to, to Mr. Adwari? Thank okay. you. It was your lack way. Okay. Thank you. We'll be back to that subject in a minute. Morning, church. Um, first of all, let me say that um, one of the major problems in Nigeria and with Christians is that we have oversized egos. We are too full of ourselves. We need to calm down. That's why we don't comply with anything. We're just, you know, big man. That's number one. Number two, we pay bribes because the elite lacks the discipline of compliance. We are so eager for the shortcut. These are, these, you can't magic a country into order. You have to make the commitment as a Christian, as an elite, to set the example. And finally, many people think that the payment of tithes frees them of the obligation to be a good citizen. He does not, be assured. Be a good citizen first, and then your tithe will make sense. Thank you. We're saying a lot of things. Um, right at the back there, right at the back against the wall. Thank you, Pastor. Um, what I was going to say is, I, I know everyone says that in Nigeria we have 40 million Christians, but the fact is that, not that I'm judging, are they really all Christians? The fact that people come to church every Sunday and Wednesday, it doesn't make you a Christian. There were two qualifications in the Bible. Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom. Then he also said, except the man be born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. It's entering into that kingdom that determines what you do after. And then the Bible also says that by their fruits we shall know them. So check the fruits of the person before you say the person is a Christian. It's not because the person says, I'm a Christian. The Bible remind, tells us that in Antioch, it was because the people behaved like Jesus that they were called Christians. So that's the reason. And then in, Niger and in any nation, when there's a problem in a nation, God sends the church to go and fix the problem. So in Nigeria, the problem is the church. Until the church gets it right, the nation will not be fixed. And, when you, and then when you also say, okay, if we say that there are 10 million Christians in Nigeria, then we also have to narrow down to those Christians because it is those that know their God that shall be strong and will do exploits. Many times we don't really know God. We haven't spent time with him. We don't have close fellowship with him. It doesn't matter what brings us into Christ. We can come for many reasons, which is okay. The, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus preached to so many people, people who came because of bread, for fish, for healing. But the fact is that when you now come to know him, he changes our priorities. And that is in the place of fellowship that he changes our priorities. And we can, then he can now send us and says, just like uh, I sent my disciples, I send you. So until each Christian has that personal understanding and that relationship with God, Nigeria is not going to change. It's going to be left to what the whims and caprices of the people, you know, are, are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Can I say something? There is no way, there's nowhere in scripture that God promises to bless you just because you're a Christian. Okay? The promise of God is in relation to keeping his covenant. If you go to Deuteronomy chapter 28, he says, if you will walk in my way, if you will obey my commands, and, and if I translate that to the New Testament, it says, if you will be led by the Holy Spirit, these things will come upon you. So we have to deal with the idea that because we're Christians, we are entitled to blessings, we're entitled to houses and cars, 
and all those things. And recognize, and Pastor Israel said something uh, here from the pulpit last week. He said, your value as a Christian is not measured by who you are, what you have, and so on. It's measured by how much impact you have on the lives of others. Okay? So, how much impact are you having as an individual on the people around you? How much impact is the church having on the, uh, in our community? As at now, church is... It's a byword to many people. Especially if you say Pentecostal, they say Pente Rascal. Okay? So we need to begin to identify. Today in our fellowship group, the subject was Stephen. Stephen was being stoned. Heaven did not stop him from being stoned. Heaven stood up to acknowledge a great man who was ready to be stoned for Christ. Now, I've got a few people that want to say something. There was somebody, um, okay, lady that's holding up the envelope and then I'm coming down here, give her a microphone as well. Good morning, church. Just as what you were saying, Pastor, concerning as Christians, what we were told when we got into the family, we were preached a gospel that said, all other things shall be added unto you if you seek first the kingdom of God. And that is not the reality. The reality is seek ye first the kingdom of God and all other things shall be added unto you. Most of us, when we got into the Christian religion, became disillusioned and we fell out and became lost along the way. And we behaved exactly like the world behaved. The second point that I wanted to make, she has already um, touched on it, as to how much impact does the church have in the world? If God cannot access you as a Christian, and the only way he can do that as his child is in his presence, is um, speaking to him, is in fellowship, and is in reading his word. If he cannot have that access to you, to let him flow through you, how do we expect to change the rest of the world? We are meant to bring the kingdom of God to earth. We are meant to walk as Christ walk. We are meant to listen to what the Father says and do. We are not meant to be looking for things to satisfy our own desires. The reality of the gospel is the minute we enter, the minute we said, I accept Jesus into my life, is this life that we call self is hanging on the cross where Jesus died. And the life that we live is now the life of Christ. Which means, if it comes, you have to be willing to forego everything. That marriage that you so desire, that child that you want, you have to be willing and ready to put it on the altar of Christ as a sacrifice. And let the fire of God fall on it, so you can impact the rest of the world. Thank you very much. First of all, let me just summarize what you said. Somebody said, when I looked for the world, I found it in the church. When I looked for the church, I found it in the world. Um, His Excellency behind you there. Uh, thank you, Pastor. Um, this is a topic that we can use the whole day to discuss, uh, especially for those of us who have experiences. If we start relaying our experiences, we can take the whole day. But um, let me say that generally today, we have two challenges. We have challenges of leadership and challenges of followership. Both sides have problems. And if we're able to deal with the problems of both sides, they will have a better Nigeria. Well, let me say, as a church, the church has lost its leadership role in the society. Even within the church itself, I know you're a pastor, so you know, I've discussed with a lot of pastors, you know the kind of challenges you have with your, with your followers. Just the basic thing of punctuality in the church has been lost. Put a clock outside now. Let people clock in when, what time they come to the church. Church supposed to be by 10. But how many people are here by 10? Maybe those who come for Sunday school. So that even discipline of punctuality has been lost. Outside, 
me, as a governor, a former governor, I have a convoy, I must drive everybody from the road. Do such a discipline is so high in the society. And the leaders of the church do not have the courage to tell us that what you are doing is wrong. As a governor, I had many pastors that came to me, but I think maybe two out of the many ever told me, ah, governor, this thing is not right. This one is not right. Every other pastor that came, ah, you are doing well. You are doing well. You are doing well. It, it, it's so, so even the pastors that are supposed to give us, to admonish us, they are not. As a governor, I can come late to this church now, maybe 10 minutes late, like I said the other day, and I come with a lot of entourage, the pastor will stop preaching. And as I enter, I'll start greeting from number one, number two, number three. So it takes me about 20 minutes to sit down. I want to expect that when that kind of thing happens, yes, as a pastor, I like to sit down. Then change the topic you were talking, the preaching you were talking, change it and face him. Governor, this thing you have done now is not right. When you come to the church, I you even coming late, just try and find a way, don't stop the service. So if the pastors are able to, I come, oh, I'm donating 20 million to this church. Nobody will ask me how I got the 20 million. Nobody? Not this church, sir. No, 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 sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just... <laughs> Because we are here, I'm not talking, I'm just, when I say church, I just, it's general. I understand. Yeah, I understand. general thing. <laughs> Nobody will ask me. In fact, the whole church will shout and they will hail me. How I brought the money, it doesn't really matter. So what I'm saying is that the church must take its leadership role. I'm going to ask more questions of its followers. So that the followers, when they are even outside doing things that are wrong, they, they are conscious to be preached. Ah, my pastor said this one, no. My pastor said this one. Or even if you hear something about your follower and you call the person and tell the person, next time when the person is doing it, remember that you have told the church leader or the pastor has told that person, has told the person, this thing you are doing is wrong. And I'm sure we will can gradually have changes in our society. Amen. Thank you very much, sir. Let me just say a few things on this. Let's begin to drill down to solutions. And, and you know, the honest truth is, you won't find any corporate solution until you found the individual solution. We must, as individuals, change first. Be prepared to put self down. Now, how, in practical terms, can we do that? That's what I want to ask now. How do you feel, in practical terms, Thank you, Pastor. Um, so the question, um, your initial question, why do we have so many Christians in Nigeria and yet we don't see the changes? And Jesus Christ told the Pharisees, because of your tradition, you have made the word of God of no effect. And I feel that's one of the core problems in Nigeria, which um, has resulted in not um, us as Christians being the light of the world because our tradition, and that's the problem we see in Nigeria today, um, yes, corruption is a major problem, but division is also a major problem because of the different ethnicities in Nigeria. Um, you find a corrupt person because he's from this particular tribe, people will be defending him. Oh, no, 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 no. What about this? So our tradition, which we've also brought into the church and has hindered us from being the light of the world. And Jesus Christ said, if the light, if you're the salt of the earth, if it loses its flavor, it will be tossed out and people will trample it on the foot. And that's what we're beginning to see happen. People talk about Christians and they say, oh, Christianity, so many bad stuff and all of that. So um, the solution is, what did Jesus Christ say? Love your neighbor. He didn't say love your brother. He says love your neighbor as yourself. Praise God. So the prosperity gospel, come to church, sow in the church, and you will prosper. That's one of our problems. Because it's attracting people who are looking to gratify self and not to do the ministry that God has called them to. Good morning, church. 
in the solution space, I have two things to say. One is on the issue of self. There's a tendency when messages are preached in church that we tend to look at the other person and not ourselves. He talked about compliance. We're thinking about the bullion vans that do one way. But when we do one way, we don't realize we're doing exactly what we're criticizing the next person for. So these things, we need to bring them home to ourselves. We ourselves need to obey the rules. No matter how late you're for, you are for a meeting, go the right way, even if it's going to take you 30 minutes extra. My brother says something. If you are, instead of um, doing the wrong thing, start out early enough to have enough time to do the right thing. So we need to bring it back to ourselves. Not, don't look at the other person. Talk about giving. We're thinking about the person who didn't give to us. We don't remember when we did not give to another person who needed. So we need to think about self. The second thing is courage. How many of us have the courage to challenge status quo? In my office, we deal a lot with um, government agencies. And I've, I happen to be in a situation now where we need a government agency to do something. We're told if you don't do this, if you don't put them up in the hotel, you don't do this, they're not going to respond to you appropriately. But we put our foot down and we said no. And then they begin to give us challenges. Oh, this thing is going to take longer than normal. But we're still standing our ground. And one of the things I say to us is, I don't know what's wrong with you. This other company does this, that other company does that. So we need to have the courage to challenge status quo, irrespective of what challenges lie ahead. What I find is that if you keep challenging status quo, after a while, they'll just say, oh, that person always does the right thing. Just ignore her and they'll give you what you want. And praise the Lord. Hallelujah. If we base from our homes, the home is very important. I remember growing up, as a little child, well, in secondary prim university, I was offered a stick of cigarette. And I saw my father's face. <laughs> and I was just looking at him. My father was gentle. And I imagined the disappointment if he saw me smoking. That was enough to reject that cigarette. I wasn't enough. My father was in Port Harcourt. But every time I remembered, just disappointing him was enough to make me to stop doing things. Now, if we replace the image of people we see physically, our parents, the seniors we have, the people we want to impress, if we imagine, even sometimes when you're praying, if you imagine your God, that this is what you are meant to do, and you're doing it wrong, I feel that it is very difficult to want to disappoint the person that you look up to. If we all looked up to God, like in our homes, how we bring up our children, the values they have, the things that are wrong that we admire when we go to church, including myself, we want to show off. You want the church is an exhibit place on Sundays for people to come. Do we pray to God? Do we say what God wants to hear or do we pray for self? It says that when you pray and you pray for the kingdom, I remember also in the Bible, Paul that wrote most, most of the New Testament evangelized. People, all the disciples went out and evangelized, but we go to a certain place. Do we evangelize? Who do you preach to? Do we leave church behind when we finish church on Sundays? Our kids, what do they learn? What are their values? We all talk about corruption. Corruption is not only in government. Corruption is in homes. Corruption is with the children. It's the base and the foundation that we have. If, you're, if you teach your ch kids right, it will be difficult for them to grow up and depart from it. Like we say, you can't learn to be old left-handed in old age. How do you begin to change if you know that this is wrong from childhood, from your upbringing, from the people you look up to? So I think we have a foundational problem as a country, as a people, as Christians, as the values we have. We need to do a complete turnaround for people to appreciate the right things, not just to speak it, but to do it, and then to pray right. Thank you. Thank you. You've raised a very, very important point. The destiny of our children is in our hands. When you think about the awesome responsibility God has given you, that's why he says, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart therefrom. If you bring, do not bring up a child right, that child is going to miss it. 
in the adulthood. Sister Nkema has been putting up her hand. Let me quickly go to her. He, His Excellency said actually what I wanted to say, that when good men keep quiet, evil thrives. And um, you can imagine if all of us will have one voice and stick to it and speak the right thing. But today there's a lot of relativity. You will say it A, another Christian will come and put it as B. Another one will joy, judge the B and say C. There is a lot of gray corners in what we believe and so many things that we teach today. Let's have one voice and let good men speak out. Amen. You know, when you go over the history of our nation, you will find that it was people like Ghani Fahemi, a Muslim, that was always courageous to speak out. People like Be Korang Sumkuti. Um, these were not Christians. Where, where are the Christians? Okay, where are the Christians being able to speak out? I, I want to go... Okay, yes, I asked to give the lady there. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'll say is the solution is an in, for the individual Christian. If we claim that we trust God and we truly believe in him, we need to be ready to make ourselves uncomfortable to what he has called us to do. We need to be ready to make ourselves uncomfortable and to return God's word to him. We all claim that we believe that God will supply all our needs according to his riches in glory. Yet we're not willing to share the little we have. We all wait for the time when we have a lot before we start making a difference. The little makes a difference in most people's life rather than you wanting to drop a hundred thousand for this person today. If you just give them enough for a meal for this week, they will appreciate it more and they will understand it more. And we'll also learn that, yes, you tell yourself, I only have this much. But then if you claim you trust God to supply your needs, you shouldn't look at what you have in hand you should look at what he's going to bring to you and what he has promised you to let you know that you will never lack, that what you need you will have. He, in the Bible, Jesus even used the example of the birds not having to look for where, for food, not having to look for what to build their houses with because they know that it is always there. That how much more us that claim that we trust in God. And the church needs to go back to the way the church was in Paul's time, what he told them to do. He said, take care of the widows and those who are needy within your community. We don't have to always look for, let me solve the whole problem of Nigeria. Within Parkview, what can I do here? Within Ikoi, what can I do here? Your next door neighbor, what can you do for that person? It doesn't always have to be the biggest dream. Sometimes start small and see the ripple effect of what you have done move on from one person to the other. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first and foremost, let me say, I don't think there's anything wrong with Christianity as we are today. I just think that there's a problem around the implementation and how we suspend our Christian beliefs when we're making personal and decisions that affect our lives. And if we were to subdivide it even further, we should actually think about it being a problem of leadership and also a problem of followership. Most people forget that the church is a microcosm of everything that takes place in our society today. So for instance, I'm still waiting for many of the Christian church leaders who can actually stand up and say, no, we didn't accept this money that was brought to the church because we cannot prove where this money came from. You know somebody does not have that kind of means of income, but yet he brings money to the church or he comes to celebrate and nobody can have a conversation with the person that perhaps what you're doing is wrong. Now, if we talk about followership, I think where there has been a failing is that we all talk about this, that you, know, you mentioned just now that you saw somebody driving in the wrong direction. But the question is, what do we as Christians do? And there are many examples, you know, like I stop people on the road when they're on the wrong side of the road. Of course, my wife is in the car and she's fighting with me and telling me that I shouldn't do that. But I stop them and say, it is wrong. Why, where are the Christians doing that today? Everybody is complaining, but not taking action. Even at the polling booths, we, stop, we have people and we tell them, if you drive one way, you can't vote at this polling station. There's no rigging at this polling station. What is going on there? How do we fix that? Thank you. We've had the major solutions, and I can say it's not too late. The gospel needs to return to the pulpit. The word of God needs to return to the pulpit. 
Because what we are being told now is how we can live here on this earth. The, very, the, the cars, we are told that if you believe, you receive the buildings, everything is for here. Nobody is telling us what we need to know to enter the kingdom. So the first thing is that the word of God must return. Christ must be preached. When the missionaries came here earlier, we have hospitals, we have schools. Till today in my state, the Eku Hospital is a very good hospital. There are some people who will you just take to the compound. As soon as they get to the compound, they are healed because of their faith in that hospital. It was brought by missionaries. How many Christian hospitals today do we have in Nigeria? How many Christian schools do we have in Nigeria? The few that are available cannot be afforded by anybody. So, and this is the venue, the avenues by which this word can go. I remember a long time ago, over 20 years, that thought kept coming to my mind that the way we are going, if we get to a stage in this nation, Christians will not have schools to go to, except they compromise. So that was why having a school was one major thing in my heart. Because, at, and we are getting there. We are getting there very close. So we need to think about, last week I've been lamenting. If you go to this television, you have cartoon, Nickelodeon, cartoon, I said, can't we, the church, have a cartoon station? I raised it. I don't know, you know, I said, can't the church have a station like that, 24 hours Christian cartoons? Because you see these children, they are so wrapped. A two-year child will be fixed. So me, I think these cartoons, they, able, they, are, they, are, they, they are spirits. It's not, it's true. Because the way the children are attached to it, it's not ordinary pictures. So Christians too should devise a means of having our own cartoon stations. And again, finally, I want to say, as children of God, Christ did not promise us rosy, rosy road. We should know God by revelation to the point of sacrificing our lives. Recently, few pastors were harassed because something was said. Only small harassment. Nobody's talking again. Nobody is talking again. We need a voice as a church. For all that you've said, um, we've said so much today. Let me just try and round it up. I, I, if I have, I'll try and take one or two more contributions. But being a Christian is really about following Jesus Christ. That, that's in essence. They, they call them Christians in Antioch because they were followers of Jesus Christ. Not followers of money. Not followers of men, but followers of Jesus Christ. If you're going to follow Jesus Christ, uppermost in your mind is his will for your life. Okay? Um, and, and it requires for each of us to make a sacrifice. Um, this is what Paul said to the Roman church. He said, present your bodies a living sacrifice which is holy and acceptable to God. We're here on earth as it is in heaven. Our job is to bring heaven to earth, to bring the principles of God, the values. And I'm going to share one other thing and I'll ask for one or two more contributions. We here closed down our midweek service and we started a discipleship group because we felt that it is very important that you go through a discipleship. The discipleship program is not a Wednesday, Wednesday program. It's an everyday program because we expect you to do the work, to spend time. It's, it's, it's there to help you to cultivate your own relationship with God, to help you spend time in prayer, to help you spend time in the Word of God. I visited a class that was graduating yesterday 
There were about nine people in that class. Only two of them were from Guiding Light Assembly. Okay? And, and so what we have now is 70% of the people that come for the discipleship program are not from this church. They're from other churches around who value the program where we who are here don't. How many people have done Master Life? If you don't mind, can you just lift your hands? Let's see. My point is made. So, if you're not prepared to make time to, to improve your relationship with God, and I guarantee you that it will, and I have several testimonies of people who have been through Master Life and their lives have demonstrably changed. Okay? So that, that's one thing. We, we need also to exercise patience and not this self-gratification thing that's going around. Everybody wants to get something for themselves. We need to exercise patience in time Whatever God has promised you will come to pass. Do not lose focus. He must always be at the center of your life. Amen? Now, you, had, you wanted to say something, and then followed by Demola Adeojo. I wanted to say, Pastor, you asked us for a solution, a practical solution. I think um, I'm not one to quote scriptures, etc. But I think you when you look... Be. Yeah, I can. But I'm saying that's not the point of my okay. solution. It is when we go out and we look at the lives we live outside of church, I think a lot of us, if people witnessed it, we should be ashamed. A practical solution for me as a church, when I go to work, they give me a target. And I aim for my target because I know it will affect my salary, my bonus. When I'm working, whether it's fabric I'm selling, I'm aiming for something at the end of the month. As a church, we should be given targets when we leave on Sunday. This week, don't gossip. This week, don't do this. This week, go and uh, uh, evangelize. This week, go and do this. So that as I am working, there are people in my office that work with me. Because they say the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. A lot of us don't fear God. We think we'll live forever. We will fear God next month. We will fear, no, we really don't live it. And I think we should be tasked by the church as well. Everybody keeps saying the church the gospel, the this. A lot of us can quote scriptures. A lot of us can praise hallelujah from now till tomorrow. But we don't live the life that we are supposed to live. And a lot of us, I'm including myself, that's why I'm saying a lot of us. When we leave church by Wednesday, I've forgotten, I have to put myself in check. Right? If I come for a service in church on Wednesday, by Friday again, I have to put myself in check. We are corporate citizens of the church. We should check ourselves. We see something wrong, we should say, look, madam, I beg, stop. Look, don't do this. This is not right. And you should know that when you come to church, people are looking at you. You have not served God properly that week. Not because you came to dance Thanksgiving in church, but because that week you have not represented God. The Christians I respect are not because they have the biggest cars or money. That's not why they are blessed. They are the ones that inspire me. I want to be like them. They live the light of God every week. You see it in them. And I think that is what we should all aspire to do. But for me, a solution, the church should task us on Sunday. When you go this week, go and do this. Somebody sees you not doing it, challenge them. Amen. The task for this week, just as you said, is no gossip. Good morning, church. You know, this issue of Nigeria is something that is always very passionate with me. And um, two things, sir, that I believe are critical. One, do we really believe in Nigeria? We don't believe in this concept called Nigeria. How many people really here believe in this country? And I think that that is a very fundamental issue. Because when you don't believe in something, you don't care about that thing. And that is what inspires corruption as far as I'm concerned. Because at the end of the day, Nigeria really, this concept called Nigeria, 
has not been sold to Nigerians. It's true. It's not been sold to Nigerians. So there's no reason why I should also contribute my own quota to make this nation great. And so if that is not addressed, then things will continue as they are. And to me, I see that more as a leadership issue. And then the second critical thing, sir, is that there is serious disunity. And the biggest disunity is within the church. What do I mean? When I read my Bible, I see the church in Philippi, or the church in Cyprus, or the church in this place. But today, we have an area, and we have redeemed is there. Uh, for gospel is next door. This one is at the back. So we are all competing with one another. So at the end of the day, how are we going to have unity when the very structure and the way that Christianity is practiced breeds about disunity? I mean, I look at the mosques. I don't see Tajuddin Mosque next to Tafar Mosque or something. No, it's by area, it's by location. So I think, why can't, Pastor, can I even challenge you for something? Why can't, even, even the way churches are set up, why can't a council come together to even guide it? There's too much freedom in setting up churches, as far as I'm concerned. Too much freedom. And when there is too much freedom, with no standards, no guiding principles, then all you have is just anybody doing what they like. And when people are doing whatever they like, then they begin to bring in their own stories and their own options and the way that they think that things should go on and happen in a church. So I think, Pastor, that that also is a very, very fundamental thing. And it is when the church leaders get together to say that, hey, listen, we cannot, we have to even, we have to have some guiding principles to church and how we collectively, you know, organize and, and operate as a church. So, sir, those are my two, two points. critical and points. Thank you. Thank you. Let me sell Nigeria to everybody that is here. One of the biggest criticisms of Nigeria is we were formed by the amalgamation that was the, the handiwork of the British. But I want to sell Nigeria to you. The Bible says that no nation exists. The borders were defined by God. Okay? So that Nigeria exists, it was defined by God. Let us all come together and work out a way in which we can make it work. Okay? And if you are watchful, you will notice that the West is beginning to wake up to the fact that there are too many immigrants, many from Africa in their countries. They are going to make it more and more difficult for people to run from Nigeria to their countries. Now, the second thing that you raised was the issue of unity. I have formed so many groups of pastors, church for change and, 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 and so on. We, we would meet together, but I, I have concluded that you can only have unity when you gather together people that are like-minded. It, it, it would be very difficult because if people have different visions, different ideas of why you're coming together, it's going to be a problem. The unity that we have, the church in the north is pretty much very united. And they're united because of the persecution they're going through. If we had that type of persecution in the south, it wouldn't take too long for us to come together. But we're praying that we don't have it. Amen. <laughs> but the other day, I, I, I was watching the news and I saw cows in a classroom in Ede. Ede is in western Nigeria, or in the southwest. Cows in the classroom, so you know that whatever is happening in the north is moving south. Okay. 
Um, there was one more I'll talk to. Uh, you wanted to say something, Brother Dede. Thank you, sir. Uh, I feel that uh, as Christians, we know a lot about what we should do and what we should not do. And for those of us who have been in guiding light for long, we cannot say that what is coming from the pulpit is not uh, sufficient. But it's when the rubber hits the road in the business atmosphere, that's where people's Christianity shakes. I think we should go back to believing that obedience is better than sacrifice. As Christians, a proof that we know what we should be doing and not doing is the amount of sacrifice we make. People are willing to give money. People are willing to attend five services. People will go to all kinds of uh, revivals, crusades in the name of Christ. But simple thing as saying no to somebody asking you for bribe, we will find some scriptures around it. We will find a way to avoid it. A man's and we'll gift end up, makes a way for him. A man's gift makes way for him. Give unto Caesar. I think God was talking about tax and not bribe. We will find ways around it and do what we need to do. And then we come back and uh, confess to God. And next day we're going to do the same thing. I just think as Christians, we should take a stand and say we are not going to give bribe. We are not going to take a one-way road and just move on with it. Thank you, sir. Thank you very, very much. Okay, Ronke, we really have to bring this to an end. Good morning, church. Um, one thing I just want to um, add to what all has been said today is the issue of restitution. I don't hear about restitution in church anymore. People do things, we don't call them out on it, and they don't pay a price. And until you start to pay a price for things you do wrong, you don't send the rest a good and right message to other people to deter them from doing the same. Nigerians don't like embarrassment. If you call people out and you make them restitute, I think a lot of other people will sit up. Thank you. Okay. You do understand that it is not everything that restitution can be made for, um, Jim, okay? And that will be the last one that we're going to have this morning. Thank you, Pastor. Good morning, church. I think a lot has been said about church and Nigeria. I really like the comments that have been made about it's an individual walk. What we do when nobody is watching. And if we really want to change Nigeria, we just have to be the change that we want to see. Every day, everything we do, in every sticky situation, like Brother Daly was just saying, it's not easy and it's sacrificial. Everybody points at everybody else. But the choices we make, and I will go beyond the simple examples of traffic. A lot of people have corporate jobs. Some people have blue collar jobs. Do we inflate contracts? Do we pay the bribes and it's just the way things have been done? Now coming systemically to the country, I think something that we can do collectively to ease the economic burden, because a lot of the comments, I really liked Sholakwe's comments about the focus being too much, even from the church, on materiality and having programs, how to get blessed and all that. But if we want Nigeria to shine, we've had so many prophecies. What are we doing in our personal space to contribute to the economy? How many people really believe in buying Nigerian? I've made this uh, contribution several times about the communion table. I want to see mangoes and pineapples because Nigeria is the highest importer of South African apples in the world. There's nothing wrong with liking apples as long as you export mangoes and pineapples. If we want our economy to improve, we have to patronize, even if they're a bit more expensive and the quality may not yet be excellent, but every time we import from China, we're exporting jobs. So practically speaking, as a Christian, even though I travel, I now prefer and make a conscious effort to buy Nigerian, even my suits, 
because I'm then giving a job to a Nigerian designer who is employing Nigerian tailors. And when I eat, when I shop on the list, I'm not exactly going for, oh, this has to be imported. This is, I, I don't prefer. And the reason is that if we don't make conscious efforts systemically to give these companies a chance, and the, and the, the acting president has just uh, signed an executive order, executive order three is on local content, about six areas, pharmaceuticals, IT, um, footwear, 40% local content. So anybody that is in that space, please get aware and get ready so that you can expand your businesses. But collectively, as Christians now, practically, it's beyond the scriptures and it's beyond the talk because talk is really cheap. We've had programs like this before, Pastor, and everybody knows what is right and everybody says and says and says, but what are we doing? Practically, choices we make, what are we really doing as Nigerians? Are we going to fight for the destiny of this country or are we going to remain potential for another 50 years? Thank you very much, Jamoke. His Excellency, the acting president, was here yesterday for their wedding. And I told him what we would be doing today. And he gave me a question to ask you, and I'll close with that question. What are you, as an individual, going to do about the church and the nation? What are you, as an individual, going to do? He's been speaking. Uh, there's one time he said, prayer alone cannot grow our economy. And I heard the pastor challenging it and said, no, prayer can grow the economy. I said, how? Recently he said, if they bring money to church, we've heard it here from His Excellency uh, Dr. Dogan, don't take it. If you know that the money was stolen, how can somebody go and steal people's pensions? and then bring it to church. What you bring will not sanitize your life if it is ill-gotten. Amen.